We're at a stage now where we are collectively finding out that the myths we were functioning under are not functional. Because the myth was, if you had enough, you would be happy. Yes. And we have enough and we're not happy. And we are the culture that has the most, really. That's right. We in the Western world have the most, and we're not happy. And so, in a way, that myth is dying. And that's what when it, where one of the major transitions is, whether it gets violent at that point, or just matures in an evolutionary sense, that's something for all of us to work on, to help it become a smooth evolutionary sense, where people, instead of grabbing for more, start to become more. Hello, amazing ones. Welcome to another Ramdas Here and Now podcast episode. I'm your host, Jackie Dobrinska, and you are the Ramdas Satsang, this amazing community of people from around the world expanding into consciousness and love and service and these many planes of existence that we live in at the same time. Thanks for tuning in. Today, this is episode 232, The Dance of Form, and it's from a 1985 radio interview on a show called The Quest Line. It's a great dialogue back and forth, Um, and Ram Dass has some great descriptions about the difference between awakening and enlightenment. Um, He goes on to talk about the difference between wisdom and knowledge, And he touches on this process of waking up, um, of becoming aware of things we were previously blind to. And when I teach yoga teacher training programs, I use uh, the example of our limitations by focusing on our five senses, right? So we probably all know that birds can see further into the spectrum. They can see ultraviolet. So they see more colors than we do. Elephants can hear into infrasonic range and dolphins into ultrasonic ranges. And snakes can capture prey using infrared sensations. So, you know, All of this are things we don't detect, and it points to the fact that there is so much going on that we cannot perceive. But, as Ram Dass is pointing out, as we get quiet, we can start to tap into something else, Um, these deeper experiences. We may not, you know, see infrared or ultraviolet, but there's this other sense that arises. It's what the yogis might call D. Um, And when we start to tap into it and start to awaken to these other realms, you know, it starts to blow our mind a little bit. But he warns, um, don't get too attached to those either. Because, you know, awakening, it's not a straight line. It's not even a spiral path. It's not even on this plane. It's a whole other experience, not even experience. Um, And he'll talk more about that. But we touch it sometimes, right? We can touch it through these mystical experiences, whether it's through psychedelics. And he has some interesting things to say about psychedelics in this podcast. Um, They may surprise you. Uh, Or through various mystical traditions and practices. At one point, he um, opines about the merits of Christianity as a mystical tradition. And I would argue Um, that in its deepest essence, it can be a mystical path. Just look at St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and St. Clara and St. Francis of Assisi or uh, Julian of Norwich or Meister Eckhart or Thomas Merton or Richard Rohr and so many others. Um, In fact, you know, through some lenses, it teaches that we all have the ability to become a mystic and an agent for positive change. Um, which is in keeping with almost all of the traditions, all of these mystical traditions. So this episode also talks a little bit about what keeps us separate from those mystical experiences, um, those habits and myths of our culture that we really, you know, by no fault of our own, often buy into, specifically around fear and what brings happiness. Um, But we are living on multiple planes, And there's these two, right? There's the one that is the light and the dark. In Taoism, it's the Teiji Tu, right? They're the yin yang. Um, It's the dance. And on the other plane, um, it can be conceptualized as the circle that contains the yin and the yang, right? It's the wuji. It's the infinite behind it all. 
and both exist and we tap into them in different ways. So enjoy this talk and then come share your experience and your curiosities and your inspirations at the next Ramdas Soul Pod meetup. We gather as a satsang in sacred community every two weeks to discuss each of these episodes. So sign up and get the invitation by going to ramdas.org slash fellowship. Uh, the next one is on an unusual date because most of us at Love, Serve, Remember Foundation will be at the Ramdas Mountain Retreat in Boone, North Carolina. It's August 25th through 27th. And you can be there too, at least virtually. Um, this year's theme is cultivating loving presence and making peace with our shadow. Isn't that nice? Um, it'll have interactive practices and reflections and meditations. Um, there will be chanting and workshops with Krishna Das and his band, including Nina Rao. Uh, there'll be Tibetan Buddhist teachings and Dharma talks with Lama Sultram Alioni, who is amazing. Uh, she wrote a book called Feeding Your Demons. Um, there'll be meditation and talks with David Nickturn, who I'm excited to get to share the stage with. Um, and there's an exploration of today's culture with Dr. Sarah King, an amazing person who's just bringing so much light into this world and into consciousness today. Um, there's also a music ceremony with East Forest and a live podcast with Raghu Marcus and so much more. So you can sign up for the virtual retreat at ramdas.org slash retreat. Um, so check that out. And as always, we thank our sponsors for without them, we could not consistently bring you these amazing podcasts. Um, and we also couldn't do it without you, all of you who listen and all of you who donate. So if you don't already, please donate by going to ramdas.org slash donate. And as always, we hope that this episode nourishes you well, and whatever good may come from that, may it ripple out into the world, into your life, into all those you touch, and be a benefit for all beings. So, here is Ram Das, here and now. Namaste and blessings. Welcome back to the Quest Line. Thank you, Peter. I guess the first thing I want to get into is the word awakening or enlightenment is used a lot you know, in this new age. And I sometimes I sit back and, and, and I say to myself, what does it mean? And then you hear the master say, it's not explainable because it's something that you experience and therefore very difficult. I think the last time on the show you said it's like pointing a finger at the moon. The finger is not the moon. Yeah. So could we get at that again? I, I, we didn't explore last time the, the six channels that you referred to as your analogy mm -hmm. in terms of how we exist. Could yeah. we start on that again? Well, um, awakening, uh, I'd like to, there's a semantic problem that we could use these words in different ways, yeah. first of all. But I would like to use the words awakening and enlightenment. Awakening means the first realization that things aren't the way you thought they were, that the reality that you thought was absolute, which is primarily the physical, psychological planes, are only relatively real because you, for some reason, whether it's through trauma or through sex or through drugs or through meditation or through something, you experience another plane of consciousness that you experience as equally real to the one you're on. Dreams are like that. When you're in a dream, it seems quite real. Now, the dream is another plane of consciousness, and we, but we treat them by saying they're dreams. We reduce them to something less real, say they're illusory, more illusory than this. But the awakening has to do with a change in perspective or perception from which where you're standing in relation to reality. Enlightenment, on the other hand, is when you're free, meaning you're not standing anywhere. That means that you have gone through the planes or you're, they're all available to you, but you're not standing on any one of them. No, no one of them is home. They're all there. And that's a whole different realm of consciousness. That is qualitatively quite different. When you're coming out of that physical channel, which I presume would be you go out and buy a car and you feel good uh, for a while. Uh, you get a promotion uh, at work. You feel good for a while. But it seems to be a roller coaster type of effect in terms of your emotions. You're up, yes. Yes. You're, you're down. 
You're looking yes. outside of yourself exactly. to get to a sense of contentment, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But that whole feeling seems to persist and come back. But during that process, is it necessary to have had a peak experience to be able to say that there's got to be something else to life? Or could it simply be a matter of the grief and the pain that you've There's two levels. One is to say there's got to be something else, and the other is to say there is something else. See, got to be can come out of frustration and pain. Say, yeah. oh my God, there must be something else. This is so horrible. Right. I'm going up and down like a yo-yo or a right. roller coaster. The other is to say, ah... There is something else, which is the recognition, the kind of experiential recognition that there is more than you thought there was, that it isn't how you thought it was. And that's the critical one. When that realization starts to happen, is it, then do we move on to, say, the metaphysical aspects? Some people start to get into uh, astrology, uh, go to psychics, um, start to sense that there is something beyond the five physical senses. Once you understand there's a possibility that there is another way of looking at things, that sensitizes you to a lot of things that previously you never noticed. And those might be little signs at the uh, laundromat uh, for a meditation program or a psychic or something. And different people are attracted to different paths. There are a multitude of paths. And some people are not the least bit attracted to what are called the astral planes, which are things where the occult, uh, the... Um, angels, devas, uh, uh, spiritual guides, and so on. Other, and some are attracted more to some Zen kind of quality of emptiness, formlessness. Some to uh, a Christian God or the Lord. Uh, it, there are individual differences in what opens for you and what attracts you. I, I sense in your writing and in some of the other people that write about the Eastern philosophies and religions that this is really a phase, the spiritual planes of the devas, uh, the angel forms, is something you must still go beyond. Yeah. The occult. Yes. Why? Because there's still forms. There's still the roller coaster cause. Because there's as long as you're attached to a form, the form is external and it's still going to change. And it's still coming and going. And those planes are just subtler ones of this. They still have good and evil in them. They still have dark and light. They still are the realms of form. And as long as you are attached to one realm of form to push you push away another to get to one or you go towards one it's still an attachment to a realm when you talk about attachment uh, i guess you can conjure up visions of a holy man or a woman that uh, is constantly meditating um does not um very stoic no emotions whatsoever no reaction to outside stimuli is that an accurate to that's that could be attachment to emptiness Attachment, non-attachment means not standing anywhere. You could be, you could, that person, a non-attached person could be driving the bus I just came over. I could be walking down the street, could be making love, could be living life richly and fully, but without the clinging of mind. It's the whole way you deal with, like, I may aim to come here, but along the way something happens and that doesn't happen. Now, how much grabbing or suffering or what is there when I don't get what my mind created. We're constantly creating models of reality. And then the question is how quickly we can let go. And non-attachments mean you can, you, it's called you hold on tightly, let go lightly. Grab, let go, grab, let go. Grab, okay. let go. So what you're saying then in essence is it's okay to have material things. It's okay to have a lover, but it's the desire to grabbing, grab clinging, things. possessing, uh, identifying with all those qualities of mind, that's where the suffering is. That's where the pain comes. Yeah. But it must be ah, isn't it? difficult isn't it indeed? Of to course. break that. But what else have you got to do? Once you know the possibility of what the end of suffering is, what else would you do? Because the minute you are not needful in all of this, because you are resting nowhere, you just are, then the lover relationship is something that is breathtaking because it doesn't have that fear in it that goes with attachment. To love something fully and yet allow it all, because the quality that Buddha pointed out is that everything's changing all the time. You fall in love with somebody, they're gonna grow old, they're gonna die, you're gonna die, something's gonna happen, passions are gonna pass. If your attachment is to a form, you're gonna have anxiety all the time for the changing of the form. You talk about getting beyond the perception or behind the perception. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's difficult, I think, intellectually, you can understand it in a way. But when you're trying to embark upon a different path, it's somewhat difficult first to differentiate between this ego or the rational mind, the intellectual mind, yeah. whatever it is, 
because it seems to be all consuming. It's a real stinker, isn't it? All you keep doing is um, is keep quieting, quieting, and quieting, and listening deeper and deeper. You're listening for a part of your being that is awareness that is not has no um, objective identity. It's subject, not object. Mm -hmm. And anything you label isn't what it is. So it's constantly going back in. It's like the flashlight, the beam, not what the beam is focused on. Usually the beam of awareness is focused on your eye, through your eyes, looking out, through your ears, hearing, through your skin, through your tongue, um, or into your thoughts. And the thoughts are objects. But the beam of light itself is where you rest. That's where the identity is. And you just can keep approximating it. And every time you think you just got there, it's just, and you say, I'm here. That's the ego that's just taken it over, preempted it again. It's a beautiful dance. It's a beautiful dance. Um, is it, is it a, a, a step along the right path when you can first get into that observer mode where you're observing and really seeing yourself play out these tapes, these yes. addictive tapes? Yeah. That's part of, that's a step. The witness is the step. And the witness that Uspensky talks about that a lot of beings teach is uh, a way of extricating yourself from your identification with your personality, with your body, and so on. Then ultimately what you do is you witness the witness. You turn in on the witness until observer and observe disappear into what you are. So there's no separateness. There's no all. separateness. So that you are not an experiencer anymore. You are the experience. Which is, there's, there's the mystic leap right there. Sounds pretty tough. Ramnas, when you talk about that there's no separation between the witness and the observer, that there's a oneness, are we then into nirvana? Yeah. And one can experience nirvana. You don't experience it, because that's... <laughs> nirvana <laughs> isn't an experience, it's a state of being. That's the whole of the perplexity of it when you come to language. Well, I remember a program we did with Dick Sutton, and we were talking about reincarnation, yeah. and a fundamentalist Christian got on the line. And he was in a tirade about what we're talking about, reincarnation, uh, not falling in with his belief system. But at the end, as he got to the crescendo of his tirade, he was saying, well, that's like the Buddhists who talk about nirvana, and nirvana is nothing. What the hell does that get you? Mm -hmm. Now, is that you see, it's not nothing. It's everything. It's the source out of which everything is. It's like... Um, um, negative numbers or something. It's, it's the other flip of the coin. It's not any more nothing than all the rest of the stuff is. Mm -hmm. It's just that which lies within or behind form or beyond form, uh, is the way you'd say it. You believe in reincarnation? Well, reincarnation is uh, within the dance of forms, yes. It's all dream, whether it's reincarnation or incarnation or whatever you've got. It's all... Everything it's we're experiencing all, now is a dream. Well, it's all, the word dream has, of course, a slightly pejorative, it means it's not, like Taki it's saying it's a game, mm -hmm. has a slightly pejorative term. No, it's all, uh, the Indians call it maya, or illusion, or the creation of mind, creation of mind, you'd say. And Is so, it? some systems focus on reincarnation to help relieve you of your exclusive identification with this incarnation. Right by saying you have had other incarnations, or you will have, and getting you to see this life as part as a step along a sequence. But in ultimate liberation, you see that that all was just part of a series of dreams, just like this moment and now this moment, and now we just incarnated again, and here we are again. Our minds keep continuity, so we think we're the same people, but between every breath, we start all over again. We change. Yeah. But Buddha says that nirvana is a state of nothingness, right? I mean, ultimately, when you've reached enlightenment, yeah. you are part of the one soul, or God consciousness. Part of the one, but the word nothingness isn't appropriate for no? nirvana. No. It's everything and nothing. When does the dance stop? It never started from that point. So there's no stopping and starting. Stopping and starting is a time concept, and that's all within the relative reality plane. From that place, it just all is. It always was, it always will be. Nothing's happening. The coming and going is not what it's about. That's just within the, the, the projections outward. That's very difficult for us to comprehend. You can't comprehend it with the mind, because the mind is a product of it. Yes. And it can't, uh, the mind can't comprehend something meta to itself. Mm -hmm. A system cannot understand a system that incorporates it. So you're just saying be. 
Well, I'm not even, every instruction is just a method, it's a trap. Ultimately, you gotta leave that too. The concept of B is, is not what it is either. But well, these methods are all aiming you in a certain direction. It's like walking up the steps, or walking off a diving board, and then at some point you leap. Yes. But you're a spiritual guide. I'm a spiritual guide? Sure. Well, in, in a, in a, to a certain limited extent, I'm a teacher. I'm a not teacher. a guru in the sense that I'm not somebody that's uh, fully enlightened. I'm an awakened person. I'm awakening, but I'm not enlightened. In the sense there are places I'm still holding. So you're a teacher? Yes. Many times do you get the, get the impression that what you're talking about is not registering. You see a blank stare on somebody's face. Well, I always interpret that as um, my limit, that I haven't said it simply enough and that I haven't listened carefully enough. Because within everybody's life experience are transcendent moments. And it's only if you present it too, in too alien a way that a person has to reject it and say, no, I've never had that experience. But most people, say, have gone into movie theaters and they got so con involved in the film that when the lights went up, they got confused. They didn't know where they were or who they were or what was happening. Well, there's an example of shifting planes of consciousness. And most people have had trauma in their life when they've suddenly felt the realities that they hadn't felt before, like falling in love or somebody dying or something like that, something that shifted, broke through. Uh, dreams, uh, lying so, under the stars. That's an awakening process. And those are all processes where people have had the, the content they need for awakening, but because their models of reality are such, they've rejected those things. They've or they treated them as irrelevant. Yes. Yeah. So they didn't take the opportunity. The exactly. opening was there to go down the path yeah. towards enlightenment, but they rejected it. So what you're doing really with talking with somebody is you're resonating with something that they've been treating as ground and you're bringing it into figure. That's all you're doing. So they say, oh, yes, I know that. And everybody's got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of tuning to it. While you were, you were at Harvard, you experienced a feeling of emptiness that created a, I think, a yearning for wisdom. You didn't think you had wisdom. You had knowledge. Yeah. Now, you found uh, your contentment, I think, through your guru's teaching, which told you to drop all knowledge, thinking, and not to determine this, that, but to leave it to whatever. Right? Incorrect? I'm Go ahead. Hearing. I'm hearing. Well, Is that incorrect? I don't know that he said that. I mean, I think that you do learn to trust your intuition. You do treat, learn to treat your intellect differently than you were treating it before. Yeah, that's true. When we talk about this merging, what I'm trying to get to is we're in the Western society here. I have yeah. commitments in terms of a job. Mm -hmm. um, I have to, I suppose, be judgmental in terms of directing people in, in their work. I don't? Uh, yes, yes, you do. Sure. Yes, you do. Yeah. How, how can I then go on a path to enlightenment where there's just a total merging and I accept what is? If you were in the state of total merging, uh, you wouldn't be around. And then what would happen would happen, just like your heart is beating, but you're not beating your heart. It's just going on. It's sort of on automatic pilot, if you will. And all of this would be on automatic pilot. You wouldn't even be particularly around. You might drop in, but you wouldn't be there all the time. However, what usually the, the, what's called Sahaj Samadhi in Hinduism, but the coming of all of it together, is where you're in the state, but you're also here. You're also making judgments, opinions, planning. I'm doing all this stuff, and yet I'm doing it from a place in my being, which is quite timeless and quite uh, judge without judgment. Although I'm making judgments, but they're making judgments the same way I play Monopoly or the same way I would dance or be at play. We, like when you play tennis or soccer, you put your juice into it and you're playing it fully. And yet you and I, if we are playing tennis, we're both competitors and collaborators. We're working on two planes at once. We collaborated to get on the playing field on the tennis court, but then we're competing within it. And we are seeing, we're keeping both planes going at once. If we lose one of them, we're a bad sport, what it's called. Well, in that sense, you ultimately keep integrating and integrating until you're in the world, as Christ said, but not of the world. Is that then, um, you, you truly, your soul, then views your body as a vehicle, simply a vehicle? This existence? Yeah, of course, your soul's a vehicle, too. See, that's the next level, because huh? well, the individual soul. After all, go into it. It's only, this is all God and drag. I mean, this is just God and the many faces of God, just through, we are all... 
God, you and I are God talking to God. It's the one talking to the one through the many. And so even the souls, the separate souls, are already dream or dance. And then the souls are in, incarnated into body and personality. And then we think we're Peter and Richard and all that sort of thing. Um, the one soul, we're gods, or we are God. Um, how does that fit in with fundamentalist Christian thinking? Well, um, well, it fits in with Judaism, which is the antecedent, or the, it fits in with Orthodox Judaism. In the Kabbalah, for example, there is the uh, most uh, exoteric uh, Middle Eastern religions think that the idea that you are one with God is heresy. It's chutzpah. It's just not allowed. That you can only come into a relationship with God. You can't, you're not the source. But the idea, like Quakers talk about the still small voice within, or Christ talking about the kingdom of heaven is within. Uh, the idea of looking within yourself to find that higher relationship, which isn't relational because it's not two, it's one. And the whole root of, for example, Judaism, the ma major mantra, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, just the holiest words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One means not two. One means one behind the two. It's behind the good and evil, behind the devil and all of that stuff. Now, most of exoteric Christianity, which is designed to keep people from creating too much trouble for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not really for awakening. It's not a mystic tradition. It's a tradition mainly to help people live life without creating karma, you'd say at least. Then it's much down lower into the levels of good and evil. Uh, and then it's relational to God. It's not merging with God. And you know, That's a product of interpretation, though, isn't it, of, of, of the Bible? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that interpretation was done with any intent? But the interpretation is also in the writers of the Bible. You see, yeah. I mean... It's, it's gone through a number of streams. Of course it is, sure. sure. Uh, but I mean, the disciples weren't Christ. They were the disciples. Yes, I understand that. See, and the, the, the interesting thing is fundamentalist Christianity says the Bible is the word of God. And I don't think it's the word of God any more than uh, the newspaper is the word of God. It's all the word of God, or it's all come through conceptual minds, which is what it has when it comes into words. They, uh, four, four or 500 AD, I think, all references to reincarnation were stripped from the, yeah. from the Bible. Do you think that might have been done with intent by the uh, power elite of the church at that time to control people? Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you don't have reincarnation, another lifetime to look forward to or whatever, and then, of course, you can preach hell and damnation. And eternal control. hell and eternal damnation. Eternal, yeah. I forgot eternal, the words, eternal. Eternal hell, yeah. And you move God from within yes. to the church, so mm -hmm. people must come to a central point. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. You would agree with that yes. assessment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you don't identify yourself, at least it doesn't appear to me, uh, from, from reading your books, with either Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity exclusively. You tend to draw on all, all of them. Yeah. Um, is there a place for, for one religion? I think every, every extant major religion is a method. It's a way. It works for some people. Any way that'll work, use. I think that what you find is when you meet a, what in Yiddish is called a mensch, when you meet, meet a fully mature being in any of these traditions, mm -hmm. you meet a universalist. You meet somebody that will teach their method and honor their method, but they themselves will honor all methods. I mean, I can teach, for example, Raja Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga or various techniques of Hinduism. Or I can teach Buddhist meditation, or I can teach Sufi dancing, or I can teach Christian prayer. And I can honor that tradition and teach that. And at the same moment, I honor all the others as well. But I, I, for example, I'll do benefits for Christian monastic orders. I'll do benefits for Buddhist monasteries, for Hindu temples, for all the different techniques to keep them pure in their tradition. I don't demand they be universalist. Mm -hmm. But if they put out a product that's worth its salt, it will be a universalist. Was there a temptation when you came back, uh, you spent two years in India, 
with your girl initially in the 60s, right after the drug experience? 67, 8, yeah, and then again, 70 to 72. Was there a temptation when you came back, or since that time, when, since you've come back, you could have a very large following. You're very well loved and regarded by, well, thousands and thousands of people in North America. Am I? <laughs> you sure are. Uh, was there a temptation to start a following? I'm thinking of people like Rash Nish, for instance, who have yeah. this tremendous following, or Reverend Moon. I think I'm too smart in the sense of, um, I think that attracts people who want to get somebody else to do it for them. And I realize that we are in a rela personal relationship with God and that I really don't want to run, the, I don't want to be in the hotel business. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to have all that weight. First of all, because I don't think it gets anybody enlightened any faster. I mean, at least from my point of view. Second, I have the model of my guru. And he had no disciples in that sense. He had no ashrams in that sense. He was a wandering sadhu, a renunciate. And uh, you could see him for a minute, and his major statement always was jow, which means go, go away. And as opposed to the gurus in the West, which say sign up here or join here. And he said to me, no ashrams, no monasteries, Ramdas. Don't have any of that. Ramdas, um... You had the aid of psychedelic drugs to begin your awakening process, mm. right? Yeah. Now, for those in our audience who something is twigging that things aren't quite right, but they haven't had that sort of opening, would you suggest psychedelic drugs for them? I, I, I feel that the... Um, that the support system in the culture for growing spiritually is very different than it was in the 60s, in the early 60s. And that there is much more support now for doing that, and that drugs aren't quite as necessary as they were. I think they're a little anachronistic, actually, for, from a spiritual point of view. Um, I, I mean, I honor them. They serve me well. They've served many other people well. They obviously can be misused grossly by many people, just like anything else can be misused. Um, and as a method, I think they're pretty volatile to work with. Uh, I think that you've got to be very committed to want God or to want freedom, because along the way, it intensifies the sensual experiences and the realms of attachment so much that it can really quite suck you in and imprint you for a long time in uh, just more and more almost greed for enhanced sensuality because it increases the sound of music and the feeling of art, art and sexuality and all of that sort of thing. When you talk, you're talking about psychedelic drugs, are you, would, you, would you include heroin? No. Cocaine and those things? Well, uh, I would differentiate between the opiates and the tryptamines and uh, psychedelics of the tryptamines, which is mescaline, marijuana, LSD, Peyote, things like that. Oh, you agree. How do you view what's happening in our society with the rise of cocaine? Uh, I think that cocaine is not a, uh, uh, it's not a heart chemical, is what I'd say. It's, uh, it gives people an illusion of power of their mind. And uh, I think it's a, uh, I don't think it's a healthy chemical, particularly. I mean, I've watched a lot of my friends get very uh, hooked on it. I mean, freebasing particularly, I think, is really deleterious. Um, a society almost always gets what it deserves karmically. I mean, the, the fact that something as beautiful as psilocybin mushroom, which really took people into their heart spaces in a compassionate way, didn't become the drug of choice, but cocaine did, has something to do with the kind of nature of the incarnations of the people are in the society. So it's just a stage. I mean, cocaine is the drug of the social drug of choice at the moment. I don't think it's going to destroy the society by any means. What is it saying, though, uh, about the society when you have such a high usage of, of cocaine? Well, I think that there is a lot of fear in, in society. Fear that's um, kind of exacerbated by uh, the world conditions, by things like bombs, by violence, terrorism, pollution, uh, using up of resources, a whole set of things, breakdown of all kinds of 
structures that gave people security in terms of home and things like that. Um, nationalism kind of getting corrupted uh, a great deal. And that creates a lot of fear. And people have a whole different mode when they're in fear than when they're in love, if you will. You can almost polarize those two things. And when they're in fear, they tend to want to collect more for themselves now. It's what's in it for me now. And that's what you see in the universities with kids going to college. They're picking things that will get them a big return now. It's the yuppie movement that you, it's kind of very common. And that's coming out of fear of what's it's me first and what's in it for me. It's not a compassionate stance. It's not a, a timeless stance. It's a, and cocaine is part of that syndrome. It's part of getting more now. Well, it's, re it's a reaction then to that sense of emptiness, hollowness, no, or fear no of death. Hell. Fear of death. Fear of annihilation. Fear of death. So the thought process has become very short term. Very short term. Everything yes. now yes. and for me. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Isn't that really a result, though? I mean, in terms of material wealth and having a lot of things around us, I mean, yeah. the industrial age that we're just coming out of now has really pr produced a lot for Western man in terms of consumption, external things. Yeah. And it really does show, it's my, this is my belief that you cannot deal with inner contentment with external things. Because as a society as a whole, we've never, no one in history as a society has had the ability to consume as much as we consume. Yes. All it's showing us, we're at a stage now where we are collectively finding out that the myths we were functioning under are not functional. Because the myth was, if you had enough, you would be happy. Yes. And we have enough and we're not happy. And we are the culture that has the most, really. That's right. We in the Western world have the most, and we're not happy. And so, in a way, that myth is dying. And that's what when it, where one of the major transitions is, whether it gets violent at that point or just matures in an evolutionary sense, that's something for all of us to work on, to help it become a smooth evolutionary sense where people, instead of grabbing for more, start to become more. What do you think the prospects of it being a peaceful transition um, are? Because what I see and some what, uh, what some other people see is really two distinct cultures within one. Yeah. You sort of have the new age type culture for lack of a better identification. You have the old culture, the old way of looking at things, very materialistic. Yeah. Um, forcing nature to comply with our wishes. And both camps seem to be entrenching themselves harder mm. in their positions. Mm. That to me, that sort of tension would mm. seem to me that they're, they're just going to be very conflict prone that type of transition. I guess I'm not a crisis type person. I feel that these processes just keep going on and on and on and on. I don't, I don't think I have a sense that we're all going to end up, the earth's going to end up as heaven or it's going to end up as hell. I think it is an earth. It's a plane in which certain kind of work is done where those forces are just always there. And when one seems to get the upper hand, it forces the awakening of the other. And when, I mean, I used to think, for example, that Ronald Reagan as the president of the United States was in a funny way, the best thing that could happen to the spiritual movement in America, because his extremism forces the awakening of the other part of us. It's like a pendulum swing that goes back and forth. And you see that evolution is really a series of revolutions back and forth in which there is some movement towards awareness. But that movement is very infinitesimal because most of the people that take birth on the human plane are people that have to deal with just that edge of the struggle. So it's perfectly functional. So I hear you saying that everything is perfect as it is. But... Well, see, that, is, that creates a lot of dissension among people. They say, what do you mean perfect? People are dying, children are starving. And I think that it's very, you've always got to put that in context of suffering stinks and we've got to do what we can to alleviate suffering. But our desire to alleviate it and the fact that it's there, don't sit around judging God because the whole thing is as it should be, even though we must, we must play our part in it, which is working to alleviate it. But it isn't an error that it's happened. God didn't turn around and face the other way. And that's why there is suffering. Suffering is part of our journey of awakening. So it's part of a learning process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Although it's hard to say a little child that starves to death is learning. And there you say, well, until you have the vision of God, don't be too busy to judge God. Don't judge God from your mind because your mind can only see part of the picture. And if you could stand back far enough, you might see that indeed 
that being that took the birth is that child who died of starvation. And this is not just uh, a rationalization, because I'm accepting that suffering is terrible and we should do something to alleviate it. But you would still see that that child, uh, that there's perfect rhyme and reason of that from a vaster incarnational point of view. So the people that are actually on the receiving end of the suffering, that's part of their karmic path. Yes. Those of us that are more fortunate in observing the situation uh, is part of our karmic path. It gives us certainly an opportunity to Absolutely. pitch in and help. Absolutely. And, and I think uh, show our humanity. And to empathize and to all yes. This Ethiopian crisis that, that has come up, um, do you see that type of a, a sharing process on, on the North American continent towards those people? Sort of an outflowing of help? We are the world. We are the children. Yes. Yeah. Tears are not enough. Yes. You know, all these beautiful statements of that compassionate heart rising to the occasion. Yes. And it's extraordinary. We don't quite know how to honor that in a regular basis, but at impulse moments, when the media do it to us, we can respond. And we have that beauty in us. It's almost like one heartbeat pulsating in North America. That's the feeling Absolutely. I get. Absolutely. It's beautiful. It's yeah. awesome. I mean, uh, just a beautiful statement of what we are. Thank you for being with us tonight, Ram Das, and I look forward to continuing our conversation next week. I'd like that, Peter. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.